Uh, hello, Mark. Good morning. Good morning. Can you uh, introduce yourself? Uh... Sure. <laughs> my name is Mark Fisher. Uh, we are in Chicago, sitting in my living room uh, in uh, the Avondale neighborhood. I uh, am an artist, teacher, writer. I just usually say artist, and that can be an umbrella for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, I work in the group Temporary Services. Temporary Services has a publishing imprint uh, called Half Letter Press, and I also administrate the project Public Collectors, which I started in 2007. Uh, Temporary Services is a collaboration with Brett Bloom, uh, who lives in Indiana. That started in 1998. Um, and uh, began yeah. as a larger group and mm -hmm. is now the two of us working with people on a per project basis. Mm -hmm. And what is uh, Temporary Services actions and interests? Uh, we create exhibits, we create events, we collaborate regularly with other people outside of the group. Um, the focus of our work uh, changes a little from project to project, although there are definitely themes that uh, reappear quite frequently, um, right. we, uh, ways people uh, intervene in uh, shared city spaces. Uh, we've done a number of projects on prison issues. Uh, we've done projects on uh, the economy as it impacts artists. Um, we're completely independent. We always work, uh, we've always worked outside of the commercial gallery world. Um, and publishing is a huge part of our practice. We've made a publication for uh, just about every project we've done mm -hmm. and also publish uh, make publications that function more autonomous autonomously and then is is publishing a way to sustain yourself outside of the gallery system and the art market uh, it it helps it certainly um, it helps enough to at least fund our operations it doesn't always uh, fund other aspects of our lives although sometimes Mm -hmm. um, we also lecture, we do workshops, we, we teach, um, we exhibit, but, um, but we don't really participate in the, uh, the commercial gallery market. The publications we make are inexpensive. We try to keep them as, you know, as democratic as possible, produced in fairly, you know, quantities of at least usually about 500 copies, a thousand, sometimes many thousands, depending on that what they're created for. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we try to be as independent and self-sustaining as, as mm -hmm. possible. And, and you created your own project, which is Public Collectors. What's the focus of this? Uh, public Collectors started to, um, as kind of a, um, really as a sort of way of encouraging, um, people to be more generous uh, with their resources when dealing with the kind of material that um, that museums and a lot of libraries uh, have no interest in. Um, for the kind of things we make, if you want to see, you know, lots of our publications, there are some museum libraries that have them, but probably there are many in private individuals who have as good or better collections than any kind of institution. Mm -hmm. And that's true of um, most of the kinds of things I'm interested in. Also, um, I don't really care about the separation between art and other kinds of creative activity, like other kinds of publishing and self-publishing. Um, so that was sort of how it started, um, with trying to encourage people to be more available of the resources they have. Um, to other individuals outside of an institutional kind of setting. Um, but it shifted, uh, it tend to have shifted a bit more into some longer term uh, research projects or kind of exploratory things. Public Collectors also makes a lot of publications. Um, and uh, lately I've been thinking more about all of the things that are, that reside in public libraries, which are often, mm -hmm. um, their potential is really untapped, especially with a lot of printed material. There's a lot of focus on spaces for making things, which is great, and, you know, or internet access, 
while lots of print collections are, are quite neglected when you go and, and visit the library, some of those areas are really a, a ghost town. Um, and um, the thing that public libraries don't have is they don't, you know, if you ask to see something that someone has to get from behind the counter, that librarian is not probably going to have personal experience with the object they're getting for you, but at least they have sometimes more interesting things than we might expect. And they're set up to accommodate visitors in a way that individuals aren't. So, for example, at Chicago's main public library, they have quite a few fanzines, uh, you know, small press, punk magazines that a lot of people wouldn't think a library would have. Um, it's just not people's perception that libraries own this kind of stuff and it's behind the counter and you have to look it up online or look in like a binder of all the periodicals they have and know what the magazine is. So part of what I've been doing lately is more trying to goad people into using these places and for things that maybe they wouldn't mm -hmm. think that they would provide. So, so that's what it has turned to now and but it's one, one of the things I mean yeah. it, it changes yeah but and but it really started as a collection of collections and right yeah can you talk about about them and how you went uh, came uh, to be in contact with all these different people um I mean I use you know I use social media like uh, uh, tumblr um, especially I think when it first started and people made an effort to kind of know what each person was hmm. posting about. And then, I mean, what always kind of happens with these things is once you have thousands of followers and people following and unfollowing, it becomes very hard to discern what people's identities are mm -hmm. on the thing. But I think when it started, maybe there were people with kind of more distinct identities or a more distinct use of that rather than just kind of recirculating everyone else's mm -hmm. material um which is a lot what a lot of it consists of um yeah i mean i think it, it grew very organically i mean people would write about what i had presented online also their digital collections things that were maybe it doesn't seem so necessary to see the original object in person um, for me, I mean, the interest is in having direct tactile experiences of objects, but also people who know something about the culture that they come from. Mm -hmm. um, some of the people who maybe were uh, important to me in this way would be um, the late uh, collector and archivist, historian, um, Stephen Lieber, also a dealer. Mm -hmm. Um, if you went to visit Stephen Lieber's uh, basement full of incredible artist books and periodicals, he knew everything about the stuff he had and he could really um, animate those histories and answer uh, tons of questions that one might have about the stuff. Um, or my friend Stephen Perkins, who lives in Madison now, who did his research on uh, artist periodicals. So. You know, not only does he have these really fantastic and hard to see things, but he knows a lot about them. Mm. And um, and likewise, if someone comes to visit me, there are things I have, you know, there are things that I have because I'm just interested in them and I buy them as I find them. But also because I work in, you know, I am participate in this larger community of artists who self-publish mm. or artists who work in groups or um, I used to publish an underground music fanzine. I traded it in the 80s. And as a result of doing that, I traded publications with people all over the world and I mm -hmm. saved the things they sent me. So, um, you know, I don't know everything there is to know about everything I have. Mm -hmm. But in many cases, I do know the people that made the things. Mm -hmm. um, and I do tend to have maybe multiple examples of things they've made so and a lot of these things you just can't go to a public library to mm -hmm. see or you can't go to a museum to see um you have um one of the collections that are fit, that is featured on on public collectors is the the collection of uh, cds of bruno richard 
Can you tell us about how you came across the work of this uh, French artist and how you came to be in contact with him? Yeah, I, I learned about Bruno's work um, from uh, research in based in San Francisco from researchers publications. Uh, first, um, Pranks, which I probably read around the time it came out when I was maybe like 17 years old and then later in the zines. Uh, he's featured in one of the zines publications and Bruno's work. This was sort of, this is before the internet or at the very beginning of the internet. Um, Bruno's work is impossible to find in hard copy uh, in the U.S. It's uh, very minimally distributed. So it be, you know, I realized like if I want to actually see more of this work and I was curious about some of it from uh, what was shown, um, I would have to actually just contact him directly. And we started up a correspondence and I wasn't making a lot of printed things at the time. Gradually, I was doing more. Um, and we started exchanging. I started sending him more of the things I was making. At first, uh, he's a uh, really fanatical book collector. So he would ask for, he, would, he always has like hundreds of books he's looking for or things he's interested in. So sometimes I would try to find books for him and then he would send me his publications in exchange. Um, but uh, over time, I mean, it's resulted in probably like a six foot tall stack of uh, packages um, uh, that has slowed down quite a bit. I don't send him as much. He doesn't send uh, me nearly as much. Postage also has gotten so much more expensive than it used to be. Uh, I used to be able to, for $7, I could send him like a four pound envelope, just thick with paper. And now that same package would cost like $29 or something. So, um, you know, it's like what I might send him in, you know, I might send him like five packages in a year and that would now cost, mm. you know, like $150 or something, you know, or, or... And what would he send you in exchange? Um, well, you've looked through all of this stuff. So he would send me his own publications, but usually that material was dwarfed by other kinds of paper. So he would send correspondence that other artists sent to him. He would send um, film festival programs uh, that, of things he attended, then he would circle the things he saw or the things he thought were interesting. He would send packaging from things he purchased, um, uh, exhibition brochures, um, like cut out pictures. Sometimes he would um, send entire books or magazines where he cut out the things he was interested in and then sent me whatever was left over. Um, you know, I mean, basically, I think any kind of paper mm. crap. And I think one, then once the envelope was sufficiently full and couldn't really contain any more, he would just seal it and send it to me. And I, and I kind of did something similar. So I think that, I, you know, I sent to him things I attended, I would take like an extra brochure from an exhibit or um, if a friend of mine gave me 10 copies of a poster or a postcard or something, I would set aside one and mail it to him. Or if I was in a used bookstore and saw something small and interesting and cheap, I would, you know, add that and send it to him. So cool. And, and what were you also, he would send a lot of, um, if he was working on a publication or he was working on the layout for things, pasting things up, taping like little snapshots of drawings and things like that. He makes a lot of, uh, I mean, his art practice is interesting to me because he makes a ton of drawings, but he's mostly only really interested in publishing them. He rarely exhibits the original drawings. He also, from when he visited Chicago, had almost no interest in seeing um, original art. He was more interested in the bookstores, in museums, um, and, and art as it appears in publication, which is just, uh, to me, a really fascinating and peculiar mm. <laughs> attitude to him. <laughs> um, so we spent tons of time going to bookstores, but no time looking at original work. Um, and... Um, So also he would send me, like after he made a publication, if there were kind of rough drafts or corrected printouts he would that he had no use for, he would uh, mm -hmm. sometimes mail me those also. 
And yeah, how did you feel opening those envelopes with so much random stuff uh, packed together? Yeah, it's more... Um, That's an experience, I know, because yeah, I, I went through a whole thing. Right, yeah, so you look through like a third of the stuff, which, <laughs> yeah. is, which took, I think, at least a couple hours, probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's, I think it's, you know, I think it's really kind of an experience in the moment. Um, it's not the same. I don't, I leave the packages as they are. Um, not like precisely in the order things were layered on top of each other, but I don't, um, for example, if there's an interesting publication he sends, I don't usually remove it from the envelope and file it with other publications on a similar subject. So I think it's going through it. It's more about the experience of this combination mm -hmm. of just printed stuff Um, and I guess like now that, you know, enough years have passed, they sort of have a little bit of a quality of being like time capsules or something, mm -hmm. which I would never have thought about at all, you know, when they arrived, of course, that they would do this, but. But still I thought that, you know, um, when you receive like very random paper, like there are, um, uh, yellow pages just here from another country, they always seem, uh, weird and interesting mm -hmm. and strange because they're made uh, in the way of this other country. Did you have this uh, travel experience when you were... Yeah, there? no, there's definitely, there's definitely some of that or, um, you know, it would be interesting to see uh, what, especially like for things like film festivals or exhibits, um, if there were uh, particularly American things that were being represented as sort of like exotic and you know uh foreign culture in france like it was interesting to see that kind of thing or um but then also work from other cultures that maybe would be less likely to travel to the u.s and more common in uh in france um yeah and also like you know it, it, it's a window into his taste and uh the kinds of things that i don't think he would send me many things that were not interesting to him first. Mm -hmm. um, it's more that maybe he has no use for them or he took extra copies to also share with other people. Um, but yeah, I mean, each package could be like a mini exhibition of stuff. And I have um, in 2009 or no, 2007, six, 2006, Um, I did organize an exhibit at Columbia College's Book and Paper Center of, um, of those packages and, you know, and uh, yeah. presented the contents of some of the mailings and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Do you, to you, is it something that can work in an exhibition or do you really have to go through it to have a sort of experience about it? I think probably actually opening the packages just individually. I mean, it's a hard thing to accommodate in an exhibit. Um, it could have been like a series of events during the course of the show, maybe mm -hmm. it might have been better. Um, I think that, you know, the problem I think is that there's very little familiarity with his work in mm -hmm. the U.S. How would you uh, describe Bruno Richard's work to someone who has never seen it? Um, so he makes a lot of drawings. Um, his work, most of the, a lot of the drawings, I think, are... Um, are his interpretations of pre-existing images, which could be him redrawing uh, things from comic books, could be from um, film stills, documentary photos. Uh, almost all of the work I would say is uh, as a very aggressive, very violent character, um, even if it's not actually depicting violence. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a quote, at some point he said something like, you know, I dirty the world as it dirties me. Um, so a lot of times he'll redraw something that maybe seems kind of innocent, but maybe stems from like a kind of corrupt systemic structure, like just the institution of the police. So if he draws the police, he doesn't necessarily pick the drawing where police are doing something violent. Um, but he redraws them in the most violent way, even when they're just like bending over to pick something up off the ground mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and not interacting with people at all. 
I think he tends to favor those things rather than uh, just a, a more common image of police brutality. Um, he uh, There's an enormous amount of sexual violence in the work. Um, I would say kind of unfortunately, a lot of it uh, depicts women in this. There's also a sort of, um, I think, a kind of moral chaos mm -hmm. in a lot of the work where... Um, I think, I mean, one of, I think the things that makes his publications so disturbing is that, um, for example, he might draw, copy something from a uh, S&M porn magazine where it looks like there's violence, but probably, hopefully the people participating in the scene, you know, are uh, in a consensual relationship. Um he might, the same publication might also have a drawing of like some kind of violent male female situation from a uh, still from a horror movie where again, it's like, it looks violent, but it's acting. Mm. But at the same time, like Bruno also might draw from something like some kind of political torture situation where it's not consensual. Mm -hmm. And there's something I think about the way he translates everything in drawing that makes everything kind of equal. Mm. So the sort of what makes one thing okay in its source feels, it feels like everything is no longer okay mm. having been redrawn. And then to sort of further complicate all of this, he'll add all kinds of notes alongside the drawings. Like he might add some personal uh, notation about like his mother's birthday or, um, or his son's girlfriend or something like that. And then once you like take it all together, it really creates this kind of like, I don't know, there's this sort of like pandemonium you know, of uh, violence or something going through all this. And I think, um, so is his work about the world's violence or the, the inner violence within him? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think like, uh, I mean, to me, what's surprising, I think, you know, when I was younger, maybe I think, I mean, a lot of people have a curiosity for violent imagery. Mm -hmm. um, and in my experience, most people kind of work their way through that and mm -hmm. are uh, mm -hmm. eventually get to the point where it's not so interesting anymore. And I don't know that this is like a judgment mm -hmm. either way with him, but he's, he seems to never not be interested <laughs> yeah. in this kind of material. And mm -hmm. like, it was very interesting, you know, he visited Chicago seeing like how he would navigate bookstores and what kinds of things he was drawn to, which were not always like the obvious kinds of things that I would expect him to be interested in. But, um, but, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that there's also, um, I mean, and it's an aspect that comes in with the packages also is that there's, um, you know, he has, uh, I guess a very loose attitude toward privacy and mm -hmm. both of his own, like the facts of his own, life as well as things generated by other people. So um, I know, you know, he's kept published writings and diaries that talk about like what medication he's taking or like um, the book he and his late collaborator, Pascal Dury mm -hmm. made uh, Catholic, the English translation is be Catholic pornography. Uh, they talk about like how much money they make at their jobs and stuff like that. And uh, you know, so I think it, it's not just like taboos about representing sex and violence, but also about personal medical histories or money or like privacy involving relationships. So I think, um, you know, the work creates uncomfortable experiences in many different ways, not just through mm. one <laughs> strategy or one fact of the decisions he makes. Yeah. Um, would you consider his work um, as punk, or do you think it relates to punk, punk culture? Um, I mean, maybe somewhat, but um, 
I mean, I think like in it's sort of like fiercely independent quality or um, I don't know. I mean, Bruno has extremely strong opinions about about practically everything from like what color uh, a dessert should be, you know, to like um, he's scolded me on making publications that don't have page numbers. Um, like every publication should have page numbers, even if it's only 16 pages long like i mean there's not a single thing i can think of that he doesn't have like an extremely precise opinion about um so like there's all this sort of chaos in his work but also like a very fierce kind of attitude about how things should be which is maybe increasingly what punk is like too mm -hmm. it's like it has uh you know there are certain like um you know, things are codified in a certain way. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think, I guess, like, with, like, the sort of early kind of days of punk, I mean, yeah, I think he makes things that are, like, quite repellent and probably intended to be repellent to certain kinds of people. Um, but, but also, I don't really know that he... I think that if he cared very much about audience, he would do things in a completely different way and not publish things in quantities of like a hundred, um, you know, I mean, a lot of people in like underground music are much more active in the distribution of their work. And, um, when he visited Chicago, I encouraged him, you know, to, you know, if you bring things that you would like to distribute, like, you know, there's a store that would take them and it's a good place to, and he had no interest in that, you know, he was interested in, finding other books, not distributing his own books. And I think a lot of what's exciting about having a book made for him is that it gives him a bartering tool mm -hmm. to object to get other things he wants. Not because I think he loves the people who are interested in the things he makes. <laughs> um, you know, I think he makes them for like, you know, probably, yeah. I mean, it's like a tool of exchange, but, um, but, even like, you know, I mean, most people in punk culture, I mean, a lot of those publications that were made out of that culture were made in quite large quantities and there was an interest in getting them out all over the world. And uh, I think he, he has more, um, for him, I think he is, he's maybe at one point had a larger network, but it seems like now his network is more focused on like a smaller number of individuals whose practice he respects. I mean, this is a little bit like, uh, you know, guessing on my part, but. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking to us about Bruno Richard. And if people want to know more about you, they should read the I'm, art, I, yeah. art scenes number four, <laughs> which is entirely dedicated I'm to I'm sure you. if Bruno sees this, he would uh, disagree with everything. Yeah, and, and, I hope so. <laughs> and, he would, and he would insult you for filming it, and he would insult me for sitting in my house, and he'd find <laughs> something wrong with the house, <laughs> and find something wrong with your camera and, on your phone. And, uh, <laughs> 15 other things, but uh, thank you, Antoine. <laughs>